let's check how many we are now it's time i think it's time to start i will be not talking about what is chemical engineering today if we we'll see uh, the wide range of subjects and specializations available it's quite diverse so for me uh, my past and present research the common ground is continuous flow synthesis and different type of particles uh, so i'd like to talk to you today about how particle technology can be powered by continuous flow reactors okay so a little bit about myself i my background is in chemical engineering uh, i did my bachelor's from nit durgapur i'm from india and then i did my phd at national chemical laboratory and then i did one year of postdoctoral fellow at iit bombay and then i joined ucl last october so my research is uh, like a uh, briefly my research is mostly focused on particles and how to manufacture them in continuous flow so different continuous flow reactors which i have worked on throughout the years to make different type of particles which have specific functional properties and which we can tune in different way to make different type of applications so why flow reactors so first uh, there are two type of chemical reactors one is the batch reactor and one is the flow reactor so the batch reactor is basically a reactor where we put all the reactants in and we let the reactor run for some time uh, let the reaction happen and take all the react the products out and, uh, so that is a basically a batch reactor so and there is a different thing is a flow reactor where reactants we use pump the reactors into the uh, react using pumps into the reactor is which is a flow reactor so the reactions happens in flow so this is basically a schematic of a flow reactor uh, where reactions happen in flow so basic characteristics of flow reactors it provides us very good uh, heat and mass transfer characteristics and short reaction time compared to batch reactors so um, we talk uh, in the presentation about how we can use this what are these flow reactors and how we can use these flow reactors to empower particle manufacturing so the type of flow reactors we'll be talking about today is micro reactors and milli reactors so what are the micro reactors the micro reactors are very small reactors uh, where the channel size is very small so these uh, and in this graph you can in this size chart you can see uh, different reference point of micro reactors and milli reactors and compare them with something usual which we have some idea about so the micro reactors are made of channels diameter less than 1 mic 1 mic uh, millimeters so this basically confined miniature channels with typical dimensions below one millimeter in which small volumes of liquid are precisely handled. When the channel diameter is uh, more than one millimeter and but less than 2.5 to 3 millimeter, they are called mini reactors, milli reactors. The reactors can be made of glass, metals, different type of polymers, especially flu fluoropolymers like PTFE, so here we see different type of reactors, different uh, type of micro reactors, and a schematic of how flow happens in a micro reactor. So the micro reactors are different, a little different from conventional flow reactors uh, in such a way because of their size. So here we see um, the conventional plug flow reactors, which are a little bigger and micro reactors a little bit smaller than the conventional flow reactors so that is something very important to remember so why we use micro reactors uh, 
uh, what we get from reducing the size to such small degrees like one millimeter. The small size in microreactors offers uh, high mixing and mass transfer area per unit volume. So here in this chart, you see different uh, reaction times, a different mass transfer coefficient and interfacial area of these batch plus reactors and with a micro reactor. So we see with reducing the diameter of the reactor, we see the interfacial area increases uh, rapidly. So the smaller the reactor is, the interfacial area is that high. And the higher the interfacial area, the higher is the mass transfer coefficient. And the smaller it is, the better is the transfer properties in terms of chemical engineering terms. So here is an example of a reaction done in batch and the same reaction is done in a micro reactor in flow. So in batch, due to, uh, the heat transfer and the mass transfer limit due to the heat transfer and mass transfer limitations, the reaction time is quite high. It's 45 minutes plus 20 minutes. Uh, but in the same reaction, when done in flow, it takes about eight seconds. And the heat duty in batch is, we need to maintain a minus 78 degree centigrade temperature, while the same reaction can be performed in flow at only minus 30 degree temperature. So the amount of heating or cooling required also increases, uh, also decreases when you do the reaction in flow. So the economics point of view, the amount of heating duty and cooling duty that also gets lower and the process gets faster. So these are typical benefits of doing a reaction or any process in flow. So this is a little bit uh, to give a little bit idea about the market of this technology. So we see that with every year, the market is growing in different uh, type of applications, in pharmaceuticals, in chemical industry, in academia, petrochemicals, all the different fields, the micro reactors and the continuous flow synthesis, uh, both the things that are growing exponentially with time. And in the chart in the right, there is a graph where we see uh, with different years how the market share of the flow reactors is increasing compared to batch. So as you see, this is 2021. So we are slowly moving into industrialization of the technology, but there are lots of new improvements, lots of new type of reactors are being made every day and it's thriving. So these graphs are to give you guys an idea how uh, important and how relevant the technology is. So now to give a little bit of idea about how to operate the flow synthesis or how micro reactors work and what are the different components to perform an experiment or to do a synthesis in a micro reactor. First, there, we, what we need is a pump to pump the reactors into the react pump the reactants into the reactor then we need a micro mixture where the two reactants are mixed together before it goes into a residence time tube which is typically a coil with the length of which we decide based on the kinetics of the reactor how long the reaction time is based on that and we use different type of unions and joints to make those reactors connect different coils, different sections of the reactor. And there are a few other stuff which we, which are very important, like mass flow controllers. When uh, there is a gas reactant, we, we control the flow of the gas with a mass flow controller. And when the, we, the, temperature, the reaction happens at a higher or a lower temperature, we need the constant temperature baths or circulators, and there are pressure sensors and back pressure regulators to control flow during the reaction. So these are the typical components which we usually require to do a flow synthesis or operating a micro reactor. So now uh, we come to particle technology. Uh, what is a particle? The definition of a particle is a particle is a small, the textbook definition 
is a small localized object to which we can ascribe several physical or chemical properties such as volume, density, or mass. So the particle can be of different sizes. The particle could be very small sizes, close less than one nanometers, which we call nanoclusters. When the particle sizes are one nanometer to 100 nanometers, these are typically called nanoparticles. And when they are one micrometer to 100 micrometers, they, we call them microparticles. So based on the size, there are three main type of particles which uh, we deal with are microparticles, nanoparticles, and nanoclusters. But why do we need these different type of small particles? Uh, what benefit do we get from that? So first we talk about microparticles. The main benefit of micronizing a, part, a, a molecule, uh, micronizing some bulk chemicals to microparticles is that with reducing size, their interfacial area increases. So with interfacial, with increased interfacial area, the, the solubility of the particle increases. So for a drug, when we consume it, if the particles are of very small size, like microparticles, the dissolution rate into our body increases. So, and there are lots of drugs which have very uh, low solubility in water, which is our body is made of. And to take those particles, to take those drugs inside our body, the particles need to be very small size so that they can be solubilized inside our bloodstreams. So this is one of the main reason of using microparticles. And when the particles are micronized, they can be homogeneously dispersed and encapsulated for to be used for controlled drug delivery. So if so in this picture, we see this is the bulk particles, which are quite not non-uniform and very big sized. When we micronize them, we get this micronized powder. Um, the drug tablets, which we get from the stores, if we give, if those are made of these micronized particles, they will be easily soluble inside our body. And then we talk about the nanoparticles. So nanoparticles are when the particle size becomes even smaller, close to uh, when the particle size is one nanometer to hundred nanometers. So in that area of the particle size, we cannot see the particles with the optical microscope because the particle size is so small, it is smaller than the visible light wavelength. So the special properties arises from the small size laying between the bulk material and the molecules. A lot of, in lot of new properties we see in nanoparticles, which are not in the bulk material of the same molecule. So with, and those properties are only ascribed to the specific particles shape and particle size. Like, we see with different aspect ratio, the particles are of different color. So this type of special properties include magnetic properties, optical properties, as well as electrical properties. So the whole uh, area of nanoparticle research is focused on making different type of nanoparticles, which have different properties. They could be magnetic, they could be optical, they could be electrical. There could be they could be catalytic. This nanoparticles there is a new uh, area of research of making catalytic nanoparticles, which are even better catalysts than the bulk ones. So that is a huge area of research using nanoparticles. And even if we go more smaller than nanoparticles, we get nanoclusters, so which are less than one nanometer size. So now we talked about particles and flow. Now we talk about how to synthesize these particles. So 
now we talk about synthesizing the particles in flow reactors. So in the first we talked about flow reactors and now we talked about particles. Now we talk about how we make these particles in flow reactors. So when these flow reactors are operated with particles, like when a particle is present in as a reagent or intermediate or used as a catalyst or byproduct or even product. So in any way when a particle is related to the chemical reaction uh, and when we uh, choose to do that reaction in flow reactors, in micro reactors, they usually result in clogging. And this clogging phenomena is specially observed at sharp turnings and these coils because there, there is a high chance of um, the particles getting attached to the wall in the sharp turnings and the coils. And these particles can be present in different types of reactions, like especially in organic synthesis, which involve the formation of inorganic crystalline salts, which precipitate in organic solvents. And uh, there is other type of particle-oriented processes like anti-solvent and cooling precipitation for microparticle synthesis. And this whole different type of nanocolored and nanoparticle synthesis is also a type of reaction where, which involves particles. So in here we see different type of flow reactors. When we try to do a, a particle related process in flow, we usually clog the reactors. So here we see when we try to do gold nanoparticle synthesis in flow reactors, they um, deposit at the wall. You can see this uh, gold uh, layers uh, formed in the tubing walls. Here we also see the reactors clogged by different types of by barium sulfate particles. Here we see sodium uh, chloride particles. Here again, we see gold uh, nano, uh, nanoparticles clogging the reactors. And the, react, the clogging can happen in different ways. The particles can form bridges and clog the channel like this, or they can be deposited the side walls, which is called constriction, which usually gets higher and higher in size and the flow path decreases and finally the reactor clogs. So uh, the single phase and liquid liquid or gas liquid phase chemistries can be easily done in commercially available micro reactors. So the micro reactors are not a new concept. So now we buy, we can buy micro reactors which are commercially available from different companies, which uh, we can use to do uh, a liquid liquid or gas liquid phase reactions industry. They can, they are used in academia as well as industry, these commercially available micro reactors. But the main problem with the micro reactor technology now is the huge challenge of processing solids or solid particles. So, a long time back, there is a study performed in Lonza, which is a big chemical company. And they studied a huge range of important, industrially important chemical reactions. And they found that 50% of the reactions uh, would have been benefited if they are performed in flow. And out of those 50% reactions, uh, like 31% of the reactions involved uh, different type of solids. So only practically 18% of the reactions can be performed in flow. So, but this was a long time old study and with time the technology have developed, but it still shows that the importance of the scope of the microreactor technology, which can be used to perform different solid related uh, reactions. Yeah, so the, it's quantitatively demonstrated the need of the importance of the research to develop the solid handling techniques to utilize the potential of this technology. And if we uh, are able to make technologies to uh, make solids in flow, solid particles, so that they will be more reproducible, they will be more monodisperse, which we always look for when we synthesize different type of particles.
So how do we handle solid particles and flow reactors? So that there are two, three different type of mayor strategies. The first one is act using active forces like uh, ultrasound or acoustic forces. So the reactors are basically, the flow reactors are basically uh, submerged in ultrasound bath so that the ultrasound energy can remove the particles from the channel walls. So the use of ultrasound uh, is basically important. Uh, why? Because the ultrasound energy in small scale is typically higher than the, the, the supply of the acoustic energy is in the form of ultrasound. So the particles can be prohibited by bridging and accumulation inside the reactors. The ultrasound approach is studied extensively due to the fact that acoustic radiation force is typically higher than the interaction among the part among the fluids, the particles, and the capillary wall surface. And the acoustic irradiation, which is basically ultrasound, uh, can be transmitted into the system by different ways. It could be very simple, like uh, submerging the reactor into the ultrasound bath, making a pressurized uh, vessel up here in which we introduce a sonotrode, which is basically ultrasound probe to uh, transfer the ultrasound energy into the reactor. Or it, we could use piezoelectric actuators, which is like the most uh, recent technology where these uh, small piezoelectric act actuators are juxtaposed between different layers of micro reactor channels. So with the piezoelectric actuator, uh, we directly transfer the acoustic energy to the my reactors, which is more efficient than using an ultrasound bath or a pressurized vessel. But uh, though ultrasound works well for a lot of systems, there are some limitations of using an ultrasound or active force based uh, strategy. The uses of ultrasound can affect the inherent system after yield. Like it can alter the, though it controls the particles uh, to not deposit on the walls, it can alter the yield or the kinetics of the entire process. And the ultrasound energy always decreases from the point of the source. So from the sonotrode, which is ultrasound probe, the, the reactor points, which are a little far from it, we, the, the intensity decreases with the distance. So some parts of the reactors, we see the particles are forming properly in some part of the reactors where plugging or plugging happens. And uh, ultrasound is also very energy intensive. So the economic viability of using an industrial process is always very difficult using ultrasound based reactors. And as a, with ultrasound, it forms these uh, micro cavities, which uh, can also degrade the reactor. So there are always plus points and there are as always minus points of using ultrasound. So now uh, where my research is mostly focused on developing passive strategies to handling solid particles in flow reactors. So what we did is uh, basically we modified the wall weightability of the channels. So how do we handle particles in channels? So to remove, to prevent the particles sticking to the walls or depositing on the walls, the, what we can do, we basically prevent the particles from coming in contact with the walls. So what is weightability? So here uh, there are two images. One is on a lotus leaf and one is on an aluminum foil. And we put a drop on the, if we put a drop on the lotus leaf, it, the drop stays like in a drop form. And if you put it in the aluminum foil, it basically spreads to some extent. So the contact angle basically changes from different surfaces. So the lotus leaf, the contact angle is higher, so whether it is hydrophobic. And for aluminum foil, the contact angle is lower, so that it is hydrophilic. So with the hydrophilic wall, 
the particles or the phases which contains the particles, which is the continuous phase. Here it is water. It is the continuous phase because it touches the reactor walls. So when you make the reactor hydrophobic, the water phase basically makes the dispersed, the phase basically gets interchanged. And that is how the particles which are in the water are basically are not able to come in contact with the reactor walls. But how do we change the wettability? So the glass surface, which the reactor is made of, which is treated at 60 degrees with a sealant compound and the particles. Uh, and with this coating, the, uh, the reactor walls becomes hydrophobic and the particles which are enclosed inside the dispersed phase. So here in, we see the, in the hydrophilic reactor, the particles are here and the forming outside and in this interface. But when we make the reactor hydrophobic, the particles are enclosed inside this small, the segment, liquid segments, which does not come in contact with the wall. So we see making the reactor hydrophobic, we see we can operate the reactor to longer reactor volumes. So here, the reactor clogs after three reactor volumes for the case of hydrophilic, for the case of hydrophobic, the reactor, you can operate up to six, seven reactor volumes. And the next uh, type of strategy is the inert phase inversion. So from a, in a liquid, in a, from a single phase process, if we insert a liquid phase, an inert liquid phase or inert gas phase, the flow basically becomes segmented. So in this picture, we see uh, there is a laminar flow, which is a single phase flow. If we insert uh, inert solvent, which could be a gas, which could be a liquid, it basically segments the flow to different sections. So, and if the particles are formed inside the flow, which shows by A plus B here, and if the particles are in the segments of A plus B, and the yellow segments are the inert segments, which basically sweeps the particles which forms on the walls or in the channels throughout the channel. So due to the segmented the inert solvents, there is less tendency to aggregate on the walls. And due to this inert solvent, there is also enhanced recirculation inside the continuous phase, which is the A plus B here. And due to this recirculation, the particles have less tendency to deposit on the walls. And these gas bubbles also act as spacers, which basically pushes the uh, particles throughout the reactor. So here we see without gas phase, this part these particle shells are coming comes out and they tend to um, deposit on the reactor walls. But when we insert the gas phase, uh, these gas bubbles basically pushes the particles throughout the liquid. So in this graph, we see the pressure drop happening in the reactor. And this is the, the red line is the tolerance limit. And see with gas insertion, the clogging time when up to an extent we can operate a reactor increases heavily. And for, with liquid insertion, we see that flow flow rates less than less than one ml per minute, we achieve this clogging free flow for hours. So here is an example of different chemical reactions involving solids done in continuous flow. So this is an inorganic reaction and this is an organic reaction of indigo synthesis. And this is, this is barium, barium sulfate synthesis. So this barium sulfate is a solid and here the indigo, which is used in um, uh, jeans and a lot of other fabrics is also a solid. So we synthesize these two chemicals in these flow reactors using these strategies. So you change the wettability so that the particles are trapped inside this dispersed phase. Here we inserted an inert gas, which pushes the uh, solids throughout the reactor. And then we introduce a liquid, which also does the same in a more vigorous manner. So here is an example of nanoparticle synthesis uh, of nickel and palladium nanoparticles. So this is a bimetallic nanoparticle. So first we make the nickel nanoparticles in this continuous star tag reactor using the nickel solution and using benzyl alcohol 
as a solvent as well as reducing agent. And when these nickel particles are formed at the outlet, we use a micro reactor and a palladium solution to form the palladium nanoparticles on top of this nickel, nano, nickel nanoparticles. So these are the nickel nanoparticles and these are the palladium nickel nanoparticles where the palladium forms, the palladium forms on the nickel nanoparticles. So these are bimetallic nanoparticles. And these nanoparticles can be used as catalyst for hydrogenation of nitroaromatic compounds. And because of this ferromagnetic nature of the nickel, it allows easy separation of the catalyst after the reaction. So here we use the segmentation, which we learned in the last few slides. Uh, so you use the segmented flow to form particles in microreactors. So here we talk about a different type of reactor, which is a confined impinging jet reactor. So with microreactors, there is a huge amount of confinement. And due to this confinement, there is this problem of handling solids. So the impinging jet reactor, the amount of confinement is less. So the particles can be handled more easily. So in this reactor, basically two different uh, liquid jets come together and form an impinge at the reactor. So this is a typically typical impinging jet reactor where from this side one stream comes and from this side the another stream comes. And here they impinge to form this kind of liquid sheets. And due to forming this kind of liquid sheets, there is intensified mixing in the sheets. And due to this mixing, the mass transfer and the is uh, quite well in this type of reactors. And but one th problem with this kind of reactors that as the sheet forms for only for a few seconds, so the it only you can be used for only fast processes as the reaccidence time is very short. So uh, how do we analyze what is happening inside a reactor in this kind of uh, impinging jet reactors? So there are two main tools. One is computational fluid dynamics, which is a simulation tool used to predict flow of fluids inside the reactor. And there is high speed imaging uh, to see what is happening experimentally in where well, made of in transparent reactors like made of glass. If the reactors are made of metal, we will be not able to see obviously. So, and this kind of process happens very fast. So we need to use a high speed imaging which like it takes a uh, thousand or 10,000 in a number of images per second. So this is the typical um, impinging jet reactor design which is available, but this reactor also uh, clogged while performing some of some particle synthesis in our studies. So we basically, uh, make the outlet bigger to prevent fouling of this reactor. And we also made the reactor volume higher so that, that the wall does not interact with the liquid sheet. So here we see in the older reactor, the sheet basically goes very close to the wall. So the wall basically interacts with the sheet formation. So when we increased the reactor volume, the wall basically is way distant from the sheet. So this is a computational fluid dynamics image, which is a estimation of the film. And this is a high speed image, which we got from the high speed imaging experiments. So here we see uh, the, this is the formation of the film and the film location of the film basically shifts from the left to the right side because the water has a high density and N-butanol has a low density. So, the flame basically moves uh, to the lower density side. So this we predicted with this uh, computational fluid dynamics tool. And we also observed the same with this high speed react, uh, high speed imaging. So now we talked about this confined impinging jet reactors. Now we'll talk about how uh, different type of uh, particles can be made in those kind of reactors. So this liquid anti-solvent precipitation is a way of making particles, especially microparticles and so that's nanoparticles. So what is the anti-solvent? 
So it's basically a non-solvent for the solute, which is added to a solution. So when the solute is added to the solution, it reduces the power of the solvent. And this is applicable for a wide range of materials from drug uh, APIs to uh, inorganic, organic crystals, polymers, proteins, biomolecules, different type of uh, reagents. And so the process is very simple. We found, we find an anti-solvent for a targeted uh, particle and we make a solution of the particle and we add the anti-solvent to it. And when you add, we mix them vigorously so that the nucleation and growth happens and we get these particles. So the typical way to do it in batch, we make a solution of the particle and then we add the anti-solvent using a syringe and we stir the reactor. And then we get these nanocrystals or microcrystals. So the general advantage of this process is no, we do not require any high temperature or pressure and there is no expensive instrumentation and it is easier to scale and it can easily improve, you can easily control the particle size, morphology and the crystallinity. So now we'll talk about how to do this anti-solvent precipitation in flow. So uh, we used, uh, we selected ammonium perchlorate as a, a type of particle to synthesize in these impinging jet reactors. So it is a basically a very powerful oxidizer, an important energetic material, which is used in solid fuel propellants. So when you decrease the particle size of this ammonium perchlorate, the burning rate of the particle basically increases. So the top down, and uh, we cannot use uh, typical micronization methods like ball milling, which is, uh, which is not safe for this method, for this chemical, because it is very, um, it, it, it decomposes more than when the temperature is higher. And it also toxic, so it generates a toxic dust and it auto ignites at 240 degrees. So it is a very uh, toxic and dangerous chemical. So we used a bottom up approach, which is basically the anti-solvent method to make small particles of this ammonium perchlorate, which is in the range of 10 and 10 micrometers. And using these micronized particles will increase the burn rate to make solid fuel propellant. So first, uh, we try to use a microreactor based technology to make these nanoparticles, but, but then again, it resulted in the clogging of the reactors. So we use the ultrasound bath, as we discussed in the previously in the presentation, with the ultrasound bath, it worked properly, but again, it was very low quantity which we are able to produce using these microreactors. So we switch to an impinging jet reactor, which I explained before. So, so here is an impinging jet reactor. We fit the solution temperature, solution at a very high temperature at 50 degrees using a peristaltic pump. And here from we you fit the anti-solvent at a low temperature using a same peristalt, using a similar peristaltic pump at a very high flow rate, you can see the flow rate is very high from 70 to 300 ml per minute. And in this impinging jet reactor, they impinge to form the sheet and the particles precipitate. And then we filter out the particles and dry them. So these are the particles which are precipitated in the impinging jet reactor. And using this react controlling the flow rates, here you can see the range of flow rates. By controlling the flow rates, we can change the particle size. As we increase the flow rate, there is better mixing and the particle size decreases with time, decreases with flow rate. So here is one more example of uh, synthesizing particles in impinging jet reactors. As you said, in the impinging jet reactors, the, the precipitation happens or the particle formation happens only in the film. So when, uh, so that is why the process needs to be very fast. So what happens when there is, the process is slow. So the metformin hydrochloride is a uh, diabetes drug for which we need microparticles, so which have a better bioavailability so that they can get into our body really fast. 
but the problem with this chemical is basically the longer residence time required to precipitate these particles in the range of 30 seconds and this impinging jet reactors works only for a process where in the range of one second so how do we increase this residence time so to increase the residence time here we operated the impinging jet reactor in an inversed manner so rather than forming the film and coming out of the reactor the reactant the reaction mixture stays inside the reactor and that is how we get this longer residence time and we adjusted the flow rates in such a way so that we get the exact residence time or the reaction time we want the reactants to spend inside the reactor and that is how we made this uh, high long res residence time process also in an impinging jet reactor and here is the particles which formed in the reaction which is the, in the range of 15 microns and which have better dissolution rate than the bulk chemicals yeah so we are end of the presentation if you have any questions uh, please type it in the chat If you have any questions, type in the chat and I'll be able to answer them. So the type of micro mixtures, the type of micro mixtures are a very interesting uh, research topic on which different type of micro mixtures are being made over the years for a long time like over 10 years there it was a very um, emerging area of research and people made different type of micro mixtures but after a long time uh, of making complicated type of micro mixtures now i think we have come to a point where we use simple T mixtures or Y mixtures to mix the reactors. And uh, we use uh, different type of coiled flow uh, reactors and inverted coils, which mixes the reactants faster. So yeah, so Y mixture, T mixture, uh, there is coaxial mixture, there is different type of mixtures, uh, which can be used for micro mixing of the reactants for micro reactors. What is the usual capacity of such reactors or an industrial level? How many such units will be required? That is a very good question. So what is the capacity of these reactors? So based on the reaction time, uh, we need to decide how long the reactor needs to be. And uh, for an industrial process, there is we always need to scale up a reactor. And how do we scale up a reactor? There is two ways of scale up a reactor. One is increasing the channel diameter to some extent from where the milli reactors come in, which also have some good mixing properties as micro reactors. And the channel diameter is up to 2.5 mm. So the reactant volume is way higher. So we can always use milli reactors to on an industrial level. And uh, there is one more way is parallel, which is called parallelization, where we use one pump and that one pump feed five different parallel channels or more or 10 or 100 different type of parallel channels. And the same reactions happens in uh, five, 10 or more number of parallel channels. So which is a parallelization technique. So using this uh, scale up and parallelization technique, this kind of reactors can be used on an industrial scale. And um, there are a lot of different type of chemicals, which basically we need a fine, uh, we need in small quantities, which are very 
valuable chemicals those can always be uh, made in this small reactors and when there is requirement to go to an industrial scale uh, we can always make them parallelization or using milli reactors to form in um, this gram per day scale or even kg per day scale some of the reactors i showed in the presentation uh, some of the micro reactors milli reactors and the impinging jet reactors were used to make chemicals or drug nanoparticles or different other type of micro particles in gram per uh, in more than a gram per hour uh, scale which is pretty industrially relevant so approximately what proportion of the chemical engineering course is maths okay so I think uh, math is a very important part of chemical engineering. Uh, we use a lot of um, simulation based techniques and a lot of programming and a lot of numerical uh, problem solving techniques of modeling. So knowing math is pretty important in chemical engineering. And in the first year, you learn a little bit of math and there are lots of numerical method uh, based uh, coursework which also need to re require math to do those courses so math is pretty important i think i would like to know more about impinging jet reactors so the impinging jet reactors are basically uh, uh, some a kind of alternative to the micro reactors where it's a pretty small geometry where we flow two streams at a very high flow rate where they impinge form the film and the mixing and the reaction happens in the film so by changing the flow rate and the type of the, of the angle between the uh, two inlets we can modify different aspects of the reactor so there is a lot of tuning which you can do in impinject reactors. You can use it for longer processes, for faster processes. And by changing the velocity and the angle, we can change particle size inside the reactor. This is a very interesting reactor to study. Are these reactions that are better done in batch than flow? So how do we define better so if there are a lot of cases where the flow reactors give the same yield or the same type of react same type of products as the batch reactors but the process becomes very fast and giving a better yield so if, if sometimes the batch gives you 50 percent yield and flow gives you 70 80 even 90 percent yield and the amount of cooling or heating duty required is very low in the flow reactors. So though you get the same product, you, the, the economics of the product getting increased is better in flow reactors. So you use less energy to form the same amount of chemicals, which is always industrially better. And the reaction time also is get smaller in flow reactors. So you need to operate uh, the reactor for less time to make same amount of chemicals or particles and one more thing is it batch there you need to feed the reactor run the reactor and then you clean the reactor and then you feed the reactor again so there is a downtime in the batch reactors but while these continuous flow reactors they can be operated continuously so there is no downtime of cleaning the reactor feeding the reactor so you get the product continuously What programming softwares do you use in chemical engineering? So for doing modeling, we use MATLAB for numerical type of modeling. Uh, for computational flow dynamics, we use uh, COMSOL as well as Fluent, which are two computational fluid dynamics tool. There are way different type of uh, modeling um, tools which can be used in chemical engineering out of which you always need to know MATLAB, which is the most important uh, modeling tool. And for fluid dynamics, we use COMSOL and Fluent.
does chemical engineering require more physics than chemistry yeah you know, chemical engineering is a very diverse field and you the field you choose in inside chemical engineering that will vary how much physics is required more than chemistry but i think physics as well as chemistry both are equally needed in in different section in diverse sections of chemical engineering like in my presentation as you see uh, there is need of chemistry to understand how the particles form and but then we need physics to form to know how the flow happens inside the reactors so we need physics as well as chemistry both in chemical engineering what happens when a specialist areas are covered for the fourth year for a masters in chemical engineering so uh, for the, in the fourth year uh, for a masters in chemical engineering you would get different type of specializations like there are specializations to learn micro reactors as well there are specializations to learn batteries there are specialization in electrochemistries there are specializations to learn different type of modelings so when you learn a specialized uh, area in your final year you can do your project in the same area and then that will give you an idea of how research is and you explore um, what kind of career do you want to take you want to go to the academia do you want to go to the industry whether you want to go research you can choose uh, the specialization so it give you a deeper understanding inside the area you can do your research projects in that and then decide what to do with you next what is the future of chemical engineering what field of chemical engineering is going to have the biggest scope in future <sighs> the chemical engineering is a very diverse field as um, i mentioned in throughout my talk and the questions and this nanotechnology is pretty huge making nanoparticles a different type of functional nanoparticles is very important um, and in the for the for a sustainable future we are looking to make batteries uh, which have better capacity than now to replace fossil fuel so that is a very important uh, area of chemical engineering now making different types of nanoparticles which um, involves energy for energy implications for medical purposes for antimicrobial applications nanoparticles are used as nanotechnology and energy and using catalysis are very new type the thriving sections of chemical engineering now i would say why are nanoparticles so useful so the nanoparticles are the part the particles are very small so and from the bulk particles which are we can see with our eyes are in the range of millimeters and the nanoparticles are in the range of nanometers so so these nanoparticles due to their unique size they have different type of properties special properties which are not there in the bulk material it only happens when the particles are of that size of this 100 1 to 100 nanometer size so and and on during and that in that the particle size window the type of with the changing the particle size we get different type of properties and by tuning those properties we can make this particle functional for different type of uses like when these particles have uh magnetic properties we and when you this like i am currently working on iron oxide nanoparticles which have mag magnetic properties so when we put this particles in the magnetic field they heat up at room temperature so these type of particles are used for uh, hypothermia which is a cancer treatment when you feed the particles inside your body and we put a uh, magne external magnetic field to heat up those type of cells which are malignant so that we only kill those type of cells 
not the other type of cells so which is very different from chemotherapy where we kill all type of cells so the nano uses of nanoparticles are very huge and very diverse can chemical engineers work in the automotive industry the future of the automotive industry is focusing on batteries and like now we see with tesla and other different companies the automotive industry is making a move towards evs electric vehicles and what controls those electric vehicles market is the batteries so and batteries are basically improved or made by chemical engineers and there is a huge scope in the automotive industry if you study chemical engineering how do i explain what is chemical engineering to a 10 year old kid so basically chemical engineering in a easy to way to explain is basically doing different type of chemistries in efficient way so to a 10 year old a chemistry is about cooking or maybe um, some water and oil where the water mixes with the oil so and different type of reactions like uh, fireworks so those are the chemistries that a 10 year old kid understand and to do we can explain that to do those chemistries in efficient manner uh, that branch is basically chemical engineering thank you for your questions what is the difference between chemical engineering and material science engineering so material science is about making different type of functional materials so those two areas are quite related uh, for a way number of cases like in my work i have made different type of particles so which is a part of material science engineering but making the reactors to make those particles is chemical engineering so in material science we make different type of functional materials like different type of composites nano materials and we play with the structure of the molecule and uh, make different type of functional molecules or functional molecular entities like composites and uh, metallurgy those kind of minerals and this type of stuff and uh, chemical engineering we focus on making reactors or making efficient uh, like with material science we come up with a concept of a molecule or a concept of a nanoparticle but unless the nanoparticle uh, can be made in a scaled up or industrial way or in a feasible way there is no point of having those nanoparticles or those kind of materials so a chemical engineering we make we uh, get the idea from material science and we try to make the particles in efficient way or the material in a more efficient way or in a which can be scaled up or make for the masses is microfluidics is a promising field in chemical engineering yeah microfluidics is a very promising field in chemical engineering and if you study microfluidics it's not only about making doing chemistries it's about uh, doing material science it's about in diagnostics where microfluidics is used a lot in diagnosing diseases diagnosing bacteria diagnosing viruses there are even uh, microfluidic chips which are being made to uh, make this antibody detection of covid and microfluidics is a very diverse area and there are a lot of use of microfluidics in uh, biology also like the small reactors can be used to uh, synthesize protein synthesize uh, make different cell cultures form different type of cells and uh, 
like uh, in my first postdoctoral experience, I worked on uh, cells inside microfluidics. So what we used to do, we uh, flow a cell inside a microfluidic reactor and uh, we use a electric field uh, around the reactor to put it the cells. So from to put uh, stuff inside the cell like DNAs, RNAs, we can use microfluidics to put this stuff like uh, DNAs, RNAs, or some other chemicals inside cells. So microfluidics is a very promising field, not only in chemical engineering. If you study microfluidics, there is huge amount of scope. What is the specialization in chemical engineering is advisable to work in automotive industry? I think um, for the future of the automotive industry, as I said, is in batteries. So, and though there is a lot of mechanical engineering and chemical engineering involved in making auto in the automotive industry, and the concept of engine came from a mechanical engineering, but the future of the chemical engineering, the future of the automotive industry is depending on batteries. So the field of chemical engineering where you learn to make efficient batteries uh, in which UCL is working on a great extent uh, is would be advisable if you want to go to a automotive industry. I would like to know more about catalytic nanoparticles. So there are different types of catalytic nanoparticles. Um, there, there are a lot of processes where catalyst is an uh, inevitable part of the process, uh, like uh, bimetallic nanoparticles, you know, when the particles are smaller, and uh, these uh, small nanoparticles can be used as catalyst in various amount of processes. And there is a lot of processes where even 1% increase in the yield or 2% increase in the conversion can be very important to the economics of the process. And uh, using the make, if, if you can make these catalytic nanoparticles, which are better than the bulk particles and which are even capable of making very small improvements into the process because the industrial processes are done in like so big capacity, even a 1% or 5% change in the yield would uh, result in a profit of millions. So the catalytic nanoparticles are a very um, bright um, part of chemical engineering. Microfluidic fuel cells. Uh, now, now my lab does not work on it, but there is a lot of research is going in UCL on microfluidic fuel cells, I'm sure. What was my PhD thesis topic? So my PhD thesis topic was understanding flow of particles in flow in understanding flow of particles in continuous flow reactors. So this is mostly what I explained in the talk is uh, how we make different type of particles in flow reactors. So understanding the physics of this, um, the part of the particles when they flow inside the reactors and how uh, we can do a flow process with particles. That was the mostly what my thesis was based on.
Yeah, I think it's time and I think we should stop now. You have my contact information over here. Uh, if you have any questions regarding the presentation or any scopes of about chemical engineering, you can email me or you can connect me in LinkedIn or Twitter. And thank all of you for joining for the test and lecture. Hopefully I can make you more interested about chemical engineering and flow reactors and particles.